Well, good afternoon. We are meeting again here at um, Old Spaghetti Factory for the first meeting of the forum for 2013. We have a, a good schedule for today as well as in the weeks coming. But I want to take this opportunity. Oh, good morning. My name is Kathy Stanton. <laughs> I, <laughs> thank you. I am one of the um, directors here at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I want to take this opportunity, in case you have been away from newspapers, um, Forrest Soth passed away, and his funeral will be this Saturday, 2 o'clock, at St. Matthew's Lutheran on Canyon Road, and the actual address, if anybody wants to know, it's 10390 Southwest Canyon Road in Beaverton at 2 p.m. Forrest, as, as we know him, uh, in this role is has always been uh, consistent in what he has done. Uh, years on the city council, years involved in water issues um, for the region, uh, years at St. Matthew's, there will be um, people attending. So if you wish to go, think about carpooling, but getting there early. And um, that again is at two o'clock this coming Saturday the 19th at St. Matthew's Lutheran. Now, to today's program, we have three of the most um, astute mayors in Washington County. Um, because they're here today, they are the most astute. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, Mayor Pete Truax from Forest Grove and um, Mayor um, Jerry Wiley, Willie from Hillsboro and Mayor Denny Doyle from Beaverton. And we are going to go east to west. So uh, Mayor Denny Doyle will be speaking first for 15 minutes, and then we will have five minutes of questions. And then Mayor Wiley from Hillsborough, Mayor Truax, Forest Grove, each getting their, 15, their 10 minutes, excuse me, I misspoke, 10 minutes and five minutes. And then if there's any time left over, uh, we can uh, continue with the Q&A. So, um, we can start right now with everybody looking to the person next to them saying, well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And we welcome Mayor Denny Doyle from the city of Beaverton. I asked Kathy not to throw anything at me. Um, but thanks for inviting me here to be here today with a couple of great mayors. Um, Kathy already touched on, but I'd like to formally add my recognition to Councilor Solf. Uh, Forrest is a, an institution in Beaverton. I made it a point of calling, adopting him as our official city historian. And you've got the details or the, the memorial service on Saturday. And I would, I'd emphasize don't be late if you want to park near the church. Um, but he'll be deeply missed. And I was, had some time with Phil, his son, and a couple of other family members, and uh, they really appreciate the fact that we did care so much about their dad. And Forrest will miss you. And because of Forrest and a lot of other people, Beaverton is a safe, welcoming, and fairly responsible community. We believe in working collaboratively, and I'm thankful our residents care so deeply about working together, getting in there in the trenches with the rest of us, and working hard. So for me and our dedicated city councilors, it starts and ends simply with our community. We are here to serve. Last spring, the Beaverton community re-elected me for a second term. I'm not sure my wife was happy about that, but I know I was. During my campaign, people would ask me, what's the secret to Beaverton's success? Two things jump at me as making the city strong. First, I believe we believe that we have the most engaged citizens in the state of Oregon. And second, we really deeply value our citizenships with all of our neighbor jurisdictions and special districts. I can point to every success the city's experienced and show how collaboration is very critical in making that happen. Community partnerships, that's really a secret that we have, both with the private sector and the public sector. People and organizations willing to work together for the common good, that is a real prize tool for me, and I yak about it as I go around the country and talk with other people. This part of Oregon, this part of the United States, really knows how to get it done. A couple examples, uh, we worked hard with Metro to bring the South Cooper Mountain area into the city. Uh, Metro approved adding 535 acres in South Cooper Mountain area into the Beavers and Urban Growth Boundary. That was done with the blessing of all the landowners there. This gives us Beaver and room to grow, to expand, and also it's going to help the Beaver School District with their growth needs. 
They are likely to build their next comprehensive high school in the South Cooper Mountain area. We've worked with developers to spur economic development throughout the community. Graymore's $60 million Progress Ridge development was another huge win. It complemented the residential investment at Polygon Northwest and others had made in South Beaverton. Graymore's investment in Beaverton brought more than 1,000 construction jobs. They got that project finished in the site of 14 months. And there are now about 700 ongoing retail jobs as a result of that. We can't forget about Big Al's across the street. Uh, just can't forget about them. I'll be there tonight. Um, we worked hard with J. Peter Corp and Company at 45 degrees central in Lanfear Enterprises to bring in voluntarily their acreages throughout the city. And that adds up to more than 100 acres brought in by other folks' request. Voluntary annexation helped us maintain our strong financial standing. We worked with our citizens and our service partners to create a $150 million urban renewal plan. It was embraced by the voters, in part because we really enjoyed the strong support from all of our public partners. Each and every one of the organizations provided a lot of input. We had a lot of talk. We talked with boards. We talked with staff. In doing it together, it made it successful. We continue to brand Beaverton as a safe place to live, work, and raise a family. We rebranded Beaverton as business friendly. We've demonstrated by our actions how we're completely committed to retaining the businesses that we have and growing those businesses. Um, of course, we continue to bring out efforts to recruit, but we're doing that through Greater Portland, Inc., and that's another story for another time. But it's got to be done as a region. It can't be done city by city. This region has to succeed in the new economy, the new world. You can't do it alone. And I think Greater Portland is going to provide a vehicle to do that. Um, also, folks have been telling me, hey, stay the course and keep working collaboratively to solve our most pressing issues. We're going to keep on down that road. We must continue to find federal and state grants to bolster our investments. In my first term, we received more than $5 million in federal and state grants. We're off to a great start in 2013 with more than $400,000 in similar grants already in hand. Hopefully there's more as we go down the road together. Another area that I hear the public talking about is the responsiveness of their city government. We continue to pay close attention to our core services. We believe in paving the roads and keeping them maintained. Our citizens also care deeply about filling potholes and repairing street lights and so on, and we get that. We continue to invest heavily in the city's infrastructure through capital improvement dollars. We do care about the basics. In Beaverton, we're recognized as a very safe city. Each and every day, our brave men and women of the police department work hard to keep us safe. Strong public safety is vital to the livability of any of our communities. For more than five years, we've been recognized as the safest city in the Northwest with populations over 75,000. Our police court and emergency management teams are the best around. Sorry, Jerry. Sorry, Pete. They're completely committed to keeping us safe. And as I look back on my first term, Beaverton really has a whole lot to be proud of. As we embark on the next term, however, as always, there's a lot to do. We made progress at the round, and in my second term, I'll redouble my efforts to revitalize this area. It's long overdue but it can happen. By working together, we can right the wrongs in the heart of Beaverton and restore people's confidence in investing in our community and investing in the round. We, I'm advocating that City Hall needs to be in the middle of urban life. We must move City Hall to the round. We must also address our public safety issues. Beaverton needs a new police and public safety center. A public safety center that will remain standing after the predicted catastrophic earthquake. A public safety center that will survive the devastating quake will let us provide service to all of us in a great time of need. We can't afford the police folks to be crippled or emergency management in a time of disaster. We can be there when you need us the most. You may have read last year's uh, Oregon, Oregonian editorial highlighting this issue. We do live, unfortunately, in a dangerous world. The tragedies at Clackamas and, and in Connecticut and other places are grim reminders that we can never take our security for granted. Our current police and emergency management and court facilities have serious security and safety issues, and I'm underplaying that. Um, last week we had leadership here in class come through, and they went down, looked at jail, so my goodness, you just bring your citizens here, they'll definitely support replacing the facility. We must plan for the future. Building our economy will continue to be a priority for my second term. We will continue to demonstrate that we are open for business, not with words, but through our actions. Currently, we are creating a concept plan for the South Cooper Mountain area. This new land will be an economic boon to South Beaverton and will support existing developments. It will also provide four to 5,000 housing units for the city's growth 
and will be served by infrastructure and urban services that are nearby and aren't there. Building these homes and the infrastructure to support it will also create much needed jobs. We must continue to find ways to create good jobs in Beaverton and throughout Washington County. In 2013 and beyond, we will continue to nurture our economy. In December, you may have noticed a story or two, Nike and the governor made headlines as Nike continues to invest in Oregon. The governor is wise to recognize the value of good jobs. Nike leases more space in Beaverton than any other company and recently became the largest private sector employer in Beaverton. You know, those folks that are inside the boundaries of Beaverton. With their new expansion, we expect an additional 12,000 jobs right here in Oregon by 2020. These actions reassure me that we are on the path towards a better tomorrow for the entire region. There are more signs of hope. Recently, Washington County's jobless rate fell to 6.8%, which is a full, almost a full point below where it was a year ago, and Beaverton's rate continues to come in slightly lower. We have stayed true to being open for business. Supporting our large and our small businesses and growing jobs is critical for our future. One of our big, su biggest successes was the approval of our Enterprise Zone designation. Since the designation was announced, Veneer, a local technology software company, has committed to a nearly a $3 million expansion. This new E-Zone is leading to new, new fan wage jobs. Veneer applied for that the day after it became permissible to do. And there's others nibbling and looking at that. If we're to grow our economy, the private sector needs a city government that is responsive and nimble, and the community needs companies to provide great jobs. It's truly a win-win. Still, we have work to do. In the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy and the devastating droughts hitting the heartland of our nation, people are talking about climate change. In Beaverton, we are committed to reducing our carbon footprint. We are committed to greening our operations as a city. We continue to encourage, and encourage our citizens and businesses to be more sustainable. We're trying to help them in a great variety of ways. Last fall, our sustainability efforts were recognized as we won the respected 2012 Mayor's Climate Protection Award, an, an initiative sponsored by the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Over 100 cities competed for that award, and we were lucky enough to come through with a win. Yeah, I think it's pretty good stuff. It's good. And it's good for the region. Next time it's going to be Pete's turn or Jerry's turn. And, uh, but they're getting to understand we really do get it, and it's not just not Portland, it's our whole region. In my second term, our city will continue to move forward. We will build a, we'll create a new comprehensive plan where the Beaverton Community Division, Civic Plan, and Urban Renewal Plan will serve as the backbone for this pioneering effort. We're adding a community health factor to this, it'll be the first city in a comprehensive plan in the state of Oregon to do so. We are creating a new Creekside District to restore and enhance our downtown creeks while improving mobility for pedestrians and bicyclists. And we will work to improve Cannon Road. That's right, and we're partnering up very closely with ODOT on that. As Beaverton's mayor, I can tell you that our good work will never be done. We must always strive to be the best. I am committed to moving us forward, as is the council. In Beaverton and in Washington County, we have a bright future. Just look at the numbers that should get you excited. By working together, we will continue to represent what is the best of Beaverton. Our county is poised for success. All the numbers we read and hear about, I don't know if you noticed that the, the wage increase was eight point something in Washington County was in the newspaper last week, was the largest increase for any county in the United States of America. Wow. Think about that. And that's really special news. That's what keeps taxes down. And I think that we can be excited about that. So I don't know if I'm on my 10 minutes, Kathy. Was that what was the waiting list? Yeah. Okay, yeah. questions, please. And I'm sorry, Forrest is not here to ask the first question. Uh, yeah. yeah, so if you have a question, please come up over here to my left. Uh, we don't have a microphone on the right today. And um, we will have to come up with a new plan. We don't need to have some person ask the first question every time now that Forrest will not be here to do that. But we do still need to be uh, respectful and uh, not elbow anybody else out of the way. Okay. Not that Virginia did that. <laughs> Virginia Bruce, forum member. Um, regarding the Luba remand of the um, Peter Court decision, uh, the, most of the uh, citizens felt that the main issue was maintaining a balance in development between housing and commercial and 
the true mixed use. Can you just speak to that and your understanding of how things will proceed? Well, yeah, I think um, the, the period to actually file an appeal is, is in progress right now because the final issue order was issued by the city and blessed. Uh, we have not heard of anybody taking it back to Luba. We know we did adjust per the citizen's request one of the features in the plan. And uh, I think that is probably going to help maintain that balance. So staff is convinced that, uh, I mean, I know, I know what the Peter Corps are going to do. And we're not worried about going out of balance, especially on the commercial side, because that is not what they want to do. Okay. Thanks. Chris Leslie, forum member. I take my hand off to you and the other two mayors. Uh, I tried to look up your organizational charts and find out information about your cities. And I was amazed that you have a water department with at least 14 divisions, which even have subdivisions. And then you have a utility department, which has another at least five divisions. I can't remember. Just looking at all the departments, I found a general trend that you have uh, pure drinking water or quality of drinking water three times in three departments. Um, I think there's a little redundancy there or duplication of efforts possibly. Between the cities? In Beaverton especially. Uh, you have duplication of cities and have a uh, water department, have so many departments, uh, isn't there something that you can slim down this, uh, it seems, an overkill on water quality? You even have a, a sanitary sewage water department. I mean, and then we have clean water services. You have everything. Isn't that too much? Well, you know, it's uh, those departments are consisting probably one individual on, assigned for different tasks, and I'll check into it because I've not heard anybody suggest that we're we're overdoing on water quality because you know we work with other cities in the region for our for the water coming in and, and eight or nine for the water going out, and uh, I've never even looked at the the, the chart the way you discussed. I'll I'll get back to you, and. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we're overstaffed because we don't have a lot of people. They may have different areas of assignment. We have a chief water engineer, Dave Winship. So I will let you know. The reason I was fired, I was an efficiency expert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. I do wait. Hi. There has been a petition that's been proposed at the City Council in Beaverton that will be uh, asking the City Council to petition our federal government to uh, change our constitution so that uh, that corporations are no longer considered pers persons. And I'm curious, like, you know, I mean, there's obviously, for some reason, been some obstacles to discussing and moving on that. I understand you have some kind of a annual meeting for your council. So right. Can you describe what's happening? I, I, think, I think the council will finally have the retreat and I think you'll see that on the agenda either on the 15th or the 22nd of this month. That is the way I read the tea leaves from council. As I told members of the group, if, if we know that the council wants to bring it forward, I'm all in favor of it. I've never not wanted it discussed publicly. So it's a good question, but I think that uh, I think you're going to see it on the agenda probably the 22nd. I doubt if tomorrow is going to be quick enough. Don't, don't lose faith. Bill. Thank you, Mayor. It's good to see you. I'm Bill Kroger, a forum member. Uh, would you talk a little bit more about Civic Center uh, Entertainment Complex? Uh, you know, I've heard you talking about that for a long time, and I was just wondering if it's in the plans or what's happening with all that. Okay, the, uh, you're talking about like an, an arts facility, yeah. performance venue. That, that is a, an issue that's been near and dear to my heart since uh, 1995, my second council meeting. I discussed the need for that, and I think the city has grown up. I think we're ready for that. We're going to deal with city hall space needs, we're going to deal with the police space needs, and then we will deal with that one. I think we have a lot of people, private sector, not public sector, a lot of private sector folks are ready to move forward on that. There's a whole big group working on it, and uh, I'm not talking just one or two folks. And there's, there's money there, and I think I'd be excited about it, but we have to deal with our basic needs first, which I think I've said, and that's going to happen in the first six months of this year. I think sometime by summer we'll have another report from, from a group 
about what it is we think we want to do for a civic uh, perform our arts venue. And it'll be more of the, I keep saying it, but everyone at least knows what that means. But that's going to be done through the private sector. And uh, I think that's the only way we can make that work. And it can work. And I think the community is, is really looking for that, at least some of the folks that can actually help finance it. So I'm glad you asked. Uh, good morning, Bruce Bartlett, former member, and I chair of CPO1, one of the Washington County CPOs. And as a member of the great unincorporated urbanized area in Washington County, I want to uh, express my uh, appreciation and, and amazement for all that Beaverton does for its citizens. And you find people that live in the unincorporated area criticizing Beaverton, but you really find very few people living in Beaverton who have the same opinion. And so. I see the great value that you add to your citizens, and I applaud you. Um, you're talking about emergency preparation in relation to the new law enforcement building. And uh, CPO1 had Jeff Rubens from TBFNR and right. Scott Porter from the OCEM at our uh, previous meeting. And the using the metric of surviving a subduction zone earthquake, I think, is appropriate for this area. Yes. And that's about a two to three month time when there won't be any uh, services reliably available to us. And uh, a, a friend told a story about uh, having a discussion with gun sellers about how much ammunition you need to be safe. <laughs> and the woman said, you know, I don't think I need ammunition. I think I need bottles of water and blankets to be safe. And so with that in mind, since Washington County, by its very nature, has a lot of service districts that overlay the cities and provide us a, uh, a very high level of service, collaboration is key to the success of our infrastructure. And with that in mind, law enforcement and, and fire and rescue are both building secure facilities that will survive these earthquakes and is there a collaborative approach that you're taking with regard to these so that they serve multiple purposes? It's a great question um, and the, the answer is yes there's a group that meets regularly that actually plans and does exercises between all all the different cities in the county TBF and R, the county the city so we actually do at least one year exercise per year and that's why the, the critical need for the public safety building to be on its feet and I, I like the young lady who suggested water. We're looking at ways to bring, tran you know, very transportable to mechanisms in to produce water, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've got some high-tech companies here that actually can take water from really poor sources and, and convert it into drinkable water. Those are the things we need to worry about. You know, I don't think the girl, you know, the mountain lions are going to move back in if we have an earthquake. But you know, we're also looking at what do we do about Hag Lake and the water supply. And you know, that Hag Lake is where we store a lot of our water. Okay, I'll stop, Kathy. I just got that for you. It's a good story. I'll tell you that later. So, well, thank you, everybody. Now, you can, you can pick on Mary, Mary Willie all you want, because I think he's next. <laughs> next up will be Mayor Jerry Willie from Hillsboro, and he will get um, seven minutes worth of Q&A, because that's what... Uh, well, we got to keep it even between you two. I don't want to get between you two. I'm thinking those were hard questions, and I'm hoping my seven minutes are a lot easier. So that's what I'm thinking. Well, good afternoon, and it is a privilege to be here. Um, just as a little bit of an advertisement, um, if you want to hear more information about what's going on to our individual cities, you need to attend each of our respective state of the cities. Uh, Denny's is coming up January 23rd, is that what I heard? Um, mine is January 31st, which I believe is one week later, and then uh, Pete, in his uh, infinite wisdom, is doing the cleanup uh, February 25th, so about a month later, and his is at uh, a lunch forum in Forest Grove with the, I believe, in collaboration with the Chamber. Um, so that's where we all actually get to make uh, some good, uh, complete analysis of it, and we do take more than 10 minutes, but we try and make it um, also fairly concise. I think Denny's is probably going to be the shortest than it should be. Uh, but <laughs> um, And Denny should know better than to speak first. Did he leave? Did, did he? I was going to say, 
Oh, I see. You're going to sit down at the table, okay, with, with the real people, no asking questions. Um, and so in Hillsboro, and what I'm going to give you in 10 minutes is I'm going to give you a really, really quick Reader's Digest version, I encourage you to come to the State of the City, but we've had a lot of activity of things going on in the city of Hillsboro in this past year, just in 2012 alone. It's been pretty exciting. Uh, the, the number one most media um, uh, focused event, though, I got to tell you, is baseball. So uh, baseball's coming to Hillsboro uh, June 17 this year, six months from now. Uh, it's going to be our uh, home opener, and we're really excited. I can tell you some statistics of just uh, activity of sales of season tickets, sales of marketing, and, uh, and a whole bunch of good things. But I can tell you that they're exceeding all expectations, so stay tuned for a great season of uh, single A baseball. Remember, it's only 38 games. It's from June to uh, till actually Labor Day. And so um, if you're at all interested in that, they have a website, Hillsboro Hops. And uh, no, I'm not answering any questions as to how we got to Hillsboro Hops. Because uh, nobody asked me. Um, We've had, uh, we've had a number of other things. Obviously, Intel is continuing to invest in our county, uh, investing. Uh, anytime you have investments that start with billions, uh, you're pretty excited about that. And I was glad to see that Denny mentioned the fact that Washington County wages is uh, fastest growing uh, in the country right now. And I think, obviously, a lot of that is driven by uh, companies like Nike and Intel making their investments in our county. And we're very, very blessed to do that. Um, we obviously have added some data centers in, uh, in Hillsboro. Those are not high employment, but they're certainly high paid jobs. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why we have embraced and, and why they are very, very attracted to Hillsboro. Again, I won't get into that in this format because of the time. And then what you probably heard also in the, in the uh, media is Project Azalea. Uh, Project Azalea tends to, uh, continues to uh, garner a lot of interest. Project Azalea, by the way, is a code name. We don't know the company. We don't know all, a lot of the facts about it. But we can tell you it's a pretty significant investment. And you're just going to have to stay tuned to see where that goes. Bottom line to all of that is that Washington County has a tremendous amount of economic activity going on right now. We are very, very blessed as a county, and I think you're going to see that continue over the next several years, which is going to make us not only a very attractive place to work, a very attractive place to live, but also is going to require a significant amount of collaboration amongst the cities and the county and, uh, and the region, quite frankly, on how we handle growth significant amounts of growth and some of it coming just a little faster than probably we would like. There are three studies going on now when you talk about handling growth and um, there's three studies right now that I think you may be aware of, you may not be aware of. Uh, they are the TV Highway Corridor Study um, that is obviously focused from basically Hillsborough to the core of Beaverton on uh, the TV highway, how can we en enhance that? How can we make that a better mobile corridor? How can we possibly add bike paths to that? How can we, um, how can we just make that a better transportation corridor for our east-west uh, folks that need to travel that direction? What we have found out, uh, many things we found out in the initial study, but most people who get on TV Highway, when I moved here in 1983, I lived over on um, that side of Hillsboro, and we took TV Highway to get into Portland. So we go down TV Highway, jump on, of course, Canyon Road, end up on Sylvan, and we were in Beaver, and we were in downtown Portland in 20 to 25 minutes. It was clean. Can't do that now. Uh, what happened? What 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 are the reasons people use TV Highway corridor now? And it's primarily, they get on and they get off. They get on and they get off. So they get on at Brookwood and they get off at Murray. Or they get on at 185th and they get off someplace else. But primarily in that quarter, most people get on and get off. So that, you handle transit much differently in that environment than you do if it's a through fare which is designed to go into, uh, into Portland. 
So stay tuned with that. That information, you're going to hear more about that over the next several months. And uh, some of the design features that I think are going to be proposed for uh, and certainly enhancing mobility on that corridor. Another study is the Aloha Reedville study. Obviously, Aloha Reedville is uh, in Washington County. They are not in a city, which uh, requires a, a different set of issues and problems because the county uh, typically is not designed for urban services. And so how can we begin to incorporate some of those services into the Aloha Reedville area and, um, and enhance the livability in those areas with bike paths, parks, libraries, all of those things that the cities uh, tend to enjoy a little bit more. Um, so again, stay tuned with that one. And then um, probably last in the study in environment uh, is something that the city of Hillsborough has just initiated a couple of months ago that has garnered a lot of interest, and that's the West Side Corridor study. And this is not to be confused with the West Side Bypass study that was done 20 years ago. I tell everyone when we talk to them that we can no longer say bypass. That's a four-letter word starting with F. It has a lot of baggage. It has a lot of history. What we are trying to do is initiate a refresh on studying transit mobility issues in Washington County. Now, why are we doing this? Well, 20 years has passed since the last study. In that time, Hillsborough has alone has gone from 50,000 people to 92,000 people. Beaverton has certainly tracked at the same pace. Washington County has tracked at that same increased level. Over the next 25 years, it's anticipated a million people are going to come to the region, the Tri-County region. Historically, 42% of those people have ended up in Washington County. What are we going to do with 420,000 new residents? We can't handle that with the current infrastructure that we have for transportation. Our corporate clients need to have the ability to get their freight to market. Their employees need to have the ability to get from point A to work and back, whether that is in Hillsborough or Beaverton or downtown Portland. We must have a, an enhanced public transit system, TriMet, which has their own financial issues, has to be redesigned and rethought of on how we can improve public transit in the Washington County area. All of those things need to be considered under one umbrella, and we need to invite everyone involved to the table to have this discussion. Everyone, including agriculture, who can't get their nursery products because we've clogged up all of our rural roads with commuters. And all of our recreational folks that need to have a place to ride their bicycles without being ran over. We need to have environmentalists at the table so we can identify and make sure that we guard and protect the very things that we love about this county. And we need to have our public and private citizens at the table as well to have this conversation about how we can improve the way we get around in Washington County. Because I can tell you, if we do nothing, we will not be able to get anywhere and we will slow down our economic opportunities considerably over the next 25 years. So, there's a lot more to that. You're going to need to come to my state of the city. You're going to need to uh, stay involved with what is going on in your county, and we very much, as mayors, appreciate that. Because we, too, touch base with each other on a regular basis. The Washington County mayors get together at least once a month, sometimes twice a month, once a month, we invite the county chair, Andy Dyke, to come in. We love to sit down with our county commissioners, talk to each other. And also, once a month, we meet as a regional group of mayors. So all the mayors from the Tri-County area get together once a month. And our focus is regional issues. We don't get to bring any of our individual stuff to the table. It's all about regional issues. 
so that we can all be informed and work together to make this region a functional region where we all collaborate and get things done. So with that, I will stop and ask for questions. Patrick, we are a farm member. Hillsborough has spent a small fortune in infrastructure to facilitate uh, until, but they haven't gotten any tax revenues to support the infrastructure. There's negotiations going on with the state. Where is that as far as the state giving Hillsborough some money back for all the infrastructure they put in for these companies to come in? Are you talking about gain share? Yes. Okay. Um, well, we're still in dis discussions with the state, is my understanding. The county has taken the lead of that because this is a county project. For those of you who don't know what gain share is, gain share is a, is a program that was initiated, I believe, in 2007, and it was where um, uh, the county and the city of Hillsborough are the primary beneficiaries of this. There are a few other uh, partners that we have in there. But it was basically if we developed um, some incentives for employment to increase over a period of time, which would increase the state income tax collection, that after a period of five years, they'd go back, recalculate it, determine what that tax revenue that was generated to the state was, and 50% of that would come back to the county and uh, the partners in it, primarily the county and the city of Hillsboro. Uh, there's been a little bit of an administrative food pot, uh with the state on this. We're working through that, and we're hoping that we, uh, the county sees that check very, very soon. We expected it several months ago, honestly. And um, uh, we're working with the state to, uh, to further define this so that we don't have these issues, or at least there's clarity among the expectations. Um, so, uh, again, a lot more detail to that, but uh, that's where we are, and hopefully we'll be getting that, the county will be getting that check very soon. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Bruce Bartlett, foreign member. I uh, want to congratulate you and Beaverton for providing neighborhood mediation services for all the citizens in the county. It's not widely known that, that Beaverton and Hillsboro together have divided the county into their own domains and each provides mediation services uh, to resolve low-level conflicts. In, I studied this issue a little bit and found out that, that Hillsboro is unique amongst cities in that they've put the mediation department in the police department rather than a neighborhood program like Beaverton's. And it makes sense to me that you would try to resolve differences at the law enforcement side rather than the kind of the civic side. Uh, the Oak Hills uh, Neighborhood Association requires that any conflicts between neighbors get mediated before law enforcement's involved. And I wonder if you have any success stories resulting from positioning the mediation department in the police department, the synergies that may have resulted. Well, I think there's, there's probably two pieces to that. One is, um, our training, and so when we have our police officers that are trained um, in um, in how to resolve issues before they escalate, then it helps our police department be much more functional and certainly efficient. And then it also communicates that back out into our citizens, so that they have a place that they can actually talk to. Um, and and the, to me, the police department is a natural place to put that because there is that respect and there's that authority that's there and so that helps that helps keep everyone uh, pretty focused there's a lot of training that goes into this i think we started this probably 10 years ago with chief louis yes um chief louis was uh, was a great um i guess innovative chief and he, he brought a number of programs to the table but that's certainly one of them mm -hmm. um i i don't um i'm sure if you'd ask our chief of police now uh, he'd be able to provide you with a number of examples. I don't have any right off the top of my head, but I know, do know that uh, that's a very, very uh, successful program. We're very happy to have that. Hi, Emily Neff. I'm a board member and a Hillsboro resident. What's the current status of the post office in Hillsboro? Are they going to shut that down, or were we one of them that they kept, were going to keep open? 
Uh, the one downtown on in, first, in yeah. Road, yeah. Yeah, it, it's my uh, understanding, and I, we haven't had this conversation for probably a couple of years. It's my understanding that's going to stay in place where it is right now. Um, we actually talked to them about um, about what we would do if they would move. Uh, not only would that, would we, we didn't particularly care for that idea, but if they were, we had some great ideas what we'd do with that spot. I don't think they cared for us planning for them, their demise. <laughs> so, um, uh, so it, it, short answer is, I believe, I haven't heard anything that says they're going to go anywhere, so I'm going to say they're staying. Anything else? My questions were a lot easier than Denny's. Kathy Stanton, forum member. Thank you for coming today, Mayor Willie. I have a question regarding um, citizen involvement in Hillsborough. Since you don't have neighborhood associations or tiger teams or some of the other um, names for citizen groups. Do you use the CPOs exclusively for getting information out to your citizens so that they can be involved like the um, South Hillsborough plan coming up or other other initiatives that the city wants to bring forward? Can you explain some of that? Well, we, we, um, we participate in the CPOs, uh, I guess, when invited um, and sometimes uh, when not invited, but um, <laughs> Uh, no, that, that is a good source of information, but we don't have neighborhood associations. And again, the primary reason why we don't have those is because um, they require manpower to facilitate those, and generally they're only active if they've got a real beef about something. So if something's quiet, then the attendance drops down, and it's actually what we consider to be, um, it's not an efficient use of revenues and sources. Um, Having said that, we, we try very hard to get uh, as much information out into the community as we possibly can. Um, and I can tell you when there's an issue, we hear about it, just like Denny and, and Pete do uh, at, at their jurisdictions. Um, but we try very hard. I mean, our, our council meetings obviously are on uh, TV, um, and uh, we have publications that we send out periodically. We have uh, council connections, that's an email alert that goes out, there's lots of stuff on our website, and we continue to try and work, find ways to enhance that communication, so um, I'm not hearing that we're, um, that we're not doing a very good job of communicating, I'm, and I'm thinking that with the uh, feedback that we typically get, we've gotten a lot of feedback in the last couple of weeks about items, so I'm thinking people are paying attention out there. Um, and Madam, um, my husband and I went to a great concert at the Walters Cultural Arts Center over the holidays, and there's a gigantic hole in the ground on Main Street at about 4th across from Amelia's. What in the heck is happening in that hole? It's huge. <laughs> well, if you drive by there now, it's not quite so big a hole. It's filled up with concrete. Um, that is uh, the 4th uh, of Main. That is a project that we have been welcoming for 20 years. If you've been down Main Street, Hillsboro, uh, that's the old Wells Fargo building. Uh, that's property that was jointly owned by Metro and the city of Hillsboro. We bought it, I don't know, 25 years ago, Catherine. Um, and uh, we finally got a developer to come in. He's building 72 or 73 apartment buildings there uh, with an underground uh, parking facility. And it's going to really significantly enhance the activity uh, that's going on downtown. So we're, we're pretty doggone excited about that one. You'll probably see another one in the next few months uh, on the corner of 3rd and Lincoln, which is a few blocks away from that project, that's going to start into place. And then we've got some other plans. So we're really focused on enhancing our downtown. But that project has certainly been the anchor. Thank you, Mayor Willis. Great questions, guys. Okay, where is Mayor Peter Truax from the Fair City of Forest Grove? <laughs> no, he did not leave. Here he comes. I come to this meeting this morning, 
or this afternoon from having my teeth cleaned. <laughs> the dental technician is Al Young's wife, Janet. So I know more about Washington County Public Affairs Forum uh, than a lot of people in this room may, and uh, had absolutely no opportunity to reply to any of the comments. <laughs> The thought occurred to me that there are a number of degrees of separation on this planet between people and jobs and experiences. And the fact that my dental technician is a member of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum indicates to me that I do indeed live in a small town. I want to thank the Washington County Public Affairs Forum for its kind invitation to share the lecture with my colleagues and friends from Beaverton and Hillsborough. Mayors Doyle and Willie are individuals who play instrumental roles in the growth, development, and for lack of a better word, protection of their cities and of Washington County. And I feel honored to be on the same agenda with them. It is through the work of the county government and its 13 cities that are located in part or entirely in Washington County that our citizens therein have such a dynamic economic engine and at the same time a culture of planned careful growth. In Forest Grove we are experiencing a rebound in the residential housing market with building permits on a steady rise since the nadir of 2009. 2008 we had 103 building permits. That may not seem like much but in 2009, we had 62. It plummeted by almost half. 2010, it went back to 71. 2011 to 80. And in the year just concluded, 91. So we are rebounding. It's not huge, but it's steady. Existing businesses in the Grove are once again bullish on their collective future. Expanding companies both in space and in the addition of all important family wage jobs. In the last year, three companies, Old Trapper, J. Lee Foods, and Pascor, have added some 50 jobs to the city of Forest Grove. Again, for a city of 20,000, that's significant. In December, the city moved to purchase a long vacant property at the corners of Pacific and A Streets and adjoining streets in the heretofore Times Litho building. The building and adjoining office complex and parking lots had sat vacant since the company ceased operation a number of years ago. Parking spaces, I hope, will become available to public parking for downtown shoppers in the very near future, if not immediately. And we've had discussions with developers in the short time since we took over the site and we'll be continuing those discussions in the future. When we talk about transportation, there are three transportation projects that are vital to Forest Grove. One is the current project at the Glencoe Road interchange with Highway 26. That again is, uh, supplies a, a lifeline to Forest Grove and it is the uh, path by which most of the freight and people move from Forest Grove east to uh, Beaverton and through the tunnel into downtown Portland. Uh, that interchange, the improvement of that, is something that will benefit uh, not only uh, the immediate area around North Plains, but also uh, western Washington County, Banks, Gaston, Cornelius, Forest Grove. Another one much closer to home is the Pacific Avenue Highway 47 interchange, which is also being improved with cooperation from uh, the Oregon Department of Transportation in Washington County. Uh, that, again, is vital for uh, shipment of goods and services uh, through western Washington County, north to Banks, south to Gaston, and east and west to Forest Grove and Cornelius. Last but not least in Forest Grove is the extension of David Hill Road from Thatcher Road to Highway 47, which gives us an opportunity to
to move some of our urban traffic off of roads that are primarily rural. Once again, the marriage between uh, urban vehicles uh, and the farm machinery is not a pleasant one. And uh, the more that we can separate that kind of traffic, the better off we are. David Hill will allow us to do that. Another aspect of development in Forest Grove is a partnership with Pacific University. From housing to parking to traffic and even football, we are engaged in a prosperous friendship with the boxers. Forest Grove's working capital with Pacific even extends beyond the city's limits. We used our bonding authority to help fund the construction of classroom facilities and other support structures at the Health Professions Campus in Hillsboro. We did that for one big reason. Well, sure, we made some money off of it, and we'll never turn that down. But we also helped in the growth of a major education, research, and service center in the fields of health and medicine. And that benefits everyone in Washington County, indeed throughout Western Oregon. Partners in that included the city of Hillsboro, Metro, Washington County, TriMet, Pacific University, Portland Community College, Tuolumne Hospital, and if I left somebody out, I'm really sorry. But that's a huge partnership, and that's a huge success story for Washington County and for the state of Oregon. I might include the federal government in that too, because that's why we don't call it a garage, right? <laughs> Federal money indicated that we call that an intermodal transit facility. It looks like a garage and it smells like a garage, but I digress. We will continue to play that partnership card and hopefully we'll play it to the advantage of Forest Grove and its neighbors. We feel it's a classic win win situation. And all the while, arts and sciences programs continue to grow at Pacific with the recent announcement of the creation of a business school complete with an MBA course of study. And that growth, by the way, is at the world headquarters of Pacific University, which is in Forest Grove. <laughs> and I want to reiterate the development of Lincoln Park as a community park with an all-purpose stadium has helped Pacific in the recruitment of student athletes, allowed for the city to sponsor summer softball, baseball, soccer, and football camps and clinics, and after a 19-year absence, it has brought college football back to Forest Grove and to Washington County. Another partnership for Forest Grove and Washington County is the rebirth, revitalization, and renewal, all those R words, offered through Fernhill Wetlands. Working with Clean Water Services, the Oregon State Parks Division, Metro, the Oregon Department of Transportation, the Fernhill Wetlands Council, Forest Grove School District, and again, Pacific University, great progress is being made in making Fern Hill not only a world-class waste treatment plant, but also a rest stop for birds in the migratory skyway, as well as a more permanent habitat for native wildfowl species. In addition, plans are afoot to add it to the paths and trails network, playing an important role in connecting us with, among other things, the awareness of our interconnectedness with our environment. And that leads me to my last point. In Forest Grove, as well as throughout this great land of ours, we're concerned with sustainability. And that word is fraught with many meanings. Just that term in dealing with the environment, obviously we must practice sustainability and we must improve and refine those practices. But sustainability must also be part of our economic discussion. And by that, I did not mean that we have to sacrifice our globe for jobs and job growth. We can and we must do both. And finally, sustainability is key to our culture and our role as a people. There is a role for everyone in practicing sustainability. There is a place for everyone to benefit by sustainability. To allow someone to be sacrificed at the altar of sustainability is to ignore social justice, and that, frankly, is unacceptable. If you are looking for precise figures of growth and development in Forest Grove, 
I apologize for that failure in that regard, but I do hope I've left you with some broad strokes of what we've done in the past, what we're doing today, and what we want to do in the future. And I leave you with the words of a hero of mine, former senator from the state of Minnesota, the happy warrior, Hubert Horatio Humphrey. He said, the moral test of a government, and in this case I paraphrase it by saying the moral test of a people, is how it cares for those in the dawn of life, our very young. How it cares for those in the sunset of life, the elderly. How it cares for those in the shadows of life, the disadvantaged, the poor, the needy. We need to pass that test, and we need to pass that test every day. Thank you. Senator, Senator Wyden says softball questions and most, most accepted. <laughs> Bill Kroger, former member, thank you for coming in, Mayor. I uh, know the police officers in uh, Beaverton and Forest in uh, Hillsboro have been through training dealing with mentally ill people. I was wondering about your police force and what was going on in that specific area. We continue to have those kinds of trainings. I can't speak specifically to it, but our new police chief, Janie Schutz, has uh, worked a great deal with that, with those programs and issues in her previous position in North Carolina, and she comes to Forest Grove with a great deal of experience in that. Uh, Janie is also working with the Cornelius Police Department. Uh, you may know that our fire chief, Michael Kincaid, is currently uh, the interim fire chief also for Cornelius, sort of combining those operations so that it's a cost saver for both cities. But um, it also allows him to do training for both uh, fire departments and by extension, I think the training for both police departments may uh, follow that lead. Um, I'm sorry I can't specifically answer your questions about how we're dealing with training towards uh, dealing with people with mental issues, but um, understand that that obviously is a concern to all of us. Be nice, Marilyn. Be nice. <laughs> I want to congratulate you on your selection as our uh, chair of the Metro Policy Advisory Committee in 2015, and uh, it's great to have Forrest Grove in that leadership position. Well, I get to try and fill the shoes of Jerry Willie, and I want to be like Jerry when I grow up. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed in Beaverton and in Hillsboro, they recently have, have initiated some programs to build affordable housing specifically for seniors. And does Forest Grove have any ambitions to pursue that? There are more senior living facility spaces in Forest Grove than any other city in the United States per capita. <laughs> Forest Grove is where the old folks go to visit their grandparents. <laughs> We are, we are continually working on that. We have a number of senior facilities. Uh, we uh, are in continual